I want to do a little bit of a longer reading tonight from Brother Lawrence's Practice of the Presence of God. And there's a lot of good passages or good things that he wrote in some of his letters that I love to share. You know, the problem is I, I grew up um, in a rather conservative Christian environment, and uh, there's a lot of trauma in that <laughs> for me. And so it, it, for a long time, robbed me of some of the beauty of these uh, Christian saints. And it's only been, I guess, in the, the later part of my life here that I've been able to set those uh, younger trials and tribulations aside and to read these things freshly with a, with a heart not carrying the past into it, but allowing it to be what it is. And so while my, my path these days um, I, I still hesitate to think of God as a person or as a, a being as such or anything that I could relate to as such. Um, it still touches my heart and I have found to be true many of these principles uh, in relating to the divine, uh, which I, I like to think of as everywhere and waiting to be recognized in all things. So I'm going to read this to you and uh, hang with me, even though it's a little long, because it tells a story. It tells a story of change that I think is quite important. He says, for the first year, and this is talking about his time in the monastery, I commonly employed myself during the time set apart for devotion with the thought of death, judgment, heaven, hell, and my sins. Thus continued for some years, applying my mind carefully the rest of the day, and even in the midst of my business, to the presence of God, whom I considered always with me and often as in me. So you see, he starts with that whole traumatic, uh, dogmatic Christian approach of sitting there and contemplating hell and sin and, uh, you know, shortcomings and all of these kinds of things, uh, which are, are quite debilitating and not necessarily mentally healthy for many. And uh, he goes through a change here. He says, at length, I came insensibly to do the same thing during my set time of prayer. So he stopped with the contemplations of the negatives in there of all of the of thinking about sin and all of that nonsense. Uh, not nonsense. Those are things that have to be dealt with. But it's it's nonsense to define yourself that way. Uh, you are created in the image of the beloved of the divine. So your nature is is Adam before the fall and not Adam after the fall. And so um, I hold tightly to to <laughs> to my holster in that regard. So he goes through this change of letting go of the thinking of the wrongdoing and the sin and the evil and the shortcomings and the failures. And he more and more just begins to pay attention to the actual presence of God, the I am that's in this moment. And he says that during my set time of prayer at length, I, I came insensibly to, to do this, which caused me a great delight and consolation. This practice produced in me so high an esteem for God that faith alone was capable to satisfy me at that point. And so this thing took on a whole life of itself within him, this, this mindfulness of the presence, of the presence of divine love, of divine grace, of divine wisdom, divine isness, sacredness in all things, that that really took on a life of itself for him and brought him all of this joy. And he says, such was my beginning, and yet I must tell you, that for the first 10 years, I suffered much. So imagine he's gone through 10 years of a committed, constant spiritual devotion, even though it had caught, it started out rather roughly with a lot of those negative things that we, we like to point that religion about. But that through endurance, you know, that he adjusted his practices, learned from his practices, learned from the thought processes and the time in it, began working with it, making it his own, really. And that something has happened to him. He says that such was my beginning. And yet I must tell you that for the first 10 years, I suffered much. The apprehension that I was not devoted to God as I wished to be. My past sins always present to my mind. And the great unmerited favors which God did me were the matter and source of my suffering. During this time, I fell often and rose again presently. So you see a real bunch of turmoil. His, this relationship with his inner divinity or with, with the divine was really a struggle. And his constant failings and shortcomings, you know, which happens when you, when you brush yourself up against these beautiful ideals. You know, when you look at these characters like Buddha and Jesus and Rama and Krishna and Ramakrishna, 
Mothman, to the Divine Mother, when you when you take all of these lives into account, it's it's it's. <laughs> what else can you do but see but see your life in contrast to such a perfection and be like, oh my God, and of course that that hurts inside, but he lets go of that, lets that wash out of him. And he says that during this time I fell often and rose again presently, which is a big secret of his, that he never chastised himself, that when he found himself doing something wrong, he simply stopped and began doing what was right. No big deals, no dramas, no, you know, earth shattering rituals, just realized, changed and went forward. I was troubled sometimes with thoughts that to believe I had received such favors was an effect of my presumption which pretended to be at once where others arrived with difficulty, or at other times that it was a willful delusion, that there was no salvation for me. All these wrestlings uh, that people go through in spiritual life, you know, this, this imposter syndrome. <laughs> you know, I don't belong here. If people really knew who I was or what I was, uh, you know, I'd have no business here. All these kinds of things, they come up. But he says, but when, when I thought of nothing but to end my days in these troubles, which did not at all diminish the trust I had in God, and which served only to increase my faith, I found myself changed all at once. And this is that beautiful moment here. Ten years of effort, of struggling, dealing with the dark, you know, having a lot of, a lot of challenges along the way. Then just one day, he says, I found myself changed all at once, and my soul which till that time was in trouble, felt a profound inward peace, as if she were in her center and her place of rest at last. Just that beautiful inner peace finally, you know, coming to light. Because we've lived our lives in such a way that the mind is so noisy and so confused and built on so many different states of being that, that aren't true and aren't accurate to, to our own experience of the now. And it takes a while for that stuff to wash out. You know, the Divine Mother says that when you wash out an inkwell, you know, you just keep pouring that clear water in and that black water keeps coming out. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. But all of a sudden, at some point, that water will suddenly come out clear. And so this is what he's talking about here. And he says, ever since that time, when this, when this dawning of inner peace happened for him, Ever since that time, I walk before God simply, in faith, with humility, and with love, and I apply myself diligently to do nothing and to think nothing that may be displeasing. I hope that when I have done what I can, he will do with me what he pleases. As for what passes in me at present, I cannot express it. I have no pain or difficulty about my state, because I have no will but that of the divine which I endeavor to accomplish in all things, and to which I am so resigned that I would not take up a straw from the ground against his order, or from any other motive than purely that of love for him. I have quitted all forms of devotion and set my prayers but those to which my state obliges me, and I make it my business only to persevere in his holy presence, wherein I keep myself by a simple attention and a general fond regard for the divine, which I may call an actual presence of God, or to speak better, a habitual, silent, and secret conversation of the soul with God, which often causes me joys, causes me raptures inwardly, and sometimes also outwardly, so great that I am forced to use means to moderate them and to prevent their appearance to others. So it's, it takes a long time. And it takes quite a diligence, quite a perseverance. And those beginning years in spiritual life can be very difficult and come down to that single string of faith, of uh, believing there's some modicum of truth in this ideal, uh, in this effort. But that at some point, you know, we cross that tilting line inside. The mind has calmed enough. The, the, the ideas of me and mine have stopped torturing us and stopped running us up, up against you know, blank walls in an effort to grow. And we come more into that stillness, more into that maturity. And we become aware of this inner shrine, this kingdom of the divine within. We become aware of that presence. And in that presence is an amazing amount of joy, an amazing amount of peace, a peace that's unconditioned, meaning that it's always there, even in those first years. He always had that available to him. 
But in those first years, we don't have a mind that's looking inward. We have a mind that's constantly running outward. And we never become familiar with the beautiful part of being human.